Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, for that great introduction. It's a pleasure to be here virtually at the Technion. I wish I was there actually, as I was in uh, 2013, a guest of Uri Weiser and others, uh, but it is what it is. So I'm going to tell you this about this work called Accelerator Level Parallelism, which began when Vijay Janapan Reddy and I were interns with Google's Mobile Silicon Group in 2018. I guess I was one of their oldest interns. All right, what's going on here? Okay, uh, so let's see. So this is a call to action. This uh, talk actually will raise more questions and provide answers. The motivation is we have lots of future apps that need much more computing at, at, on energy budgets. And as we all know, standard technology scaling is not sufficient, especially with the end of Denard scaling. Uh, Modern mobile systems on a chip or SOCs have a promising approach, and we think this approach might generalize. And this approach. And hey, Mark, involves, if you think you are sharing something, it, you do, you, at least I don't see it. You don't see, Ronnie doesn't see screens. Does anyone else see the screen? I, I see the screen. We see it. No, we see it well. Okay, I will continue. Uh, Accelerator level parallelism is the parallelism among workload components concurrently executing on multiple accelerators or what's called in the business IP blocks or intellectual property blocks, which includes CPUs. Uh, but I think, you know, we had great successes on, you know, mobile phones like Android and um, iPhones, but if we're going to use this more generally for self driving cars and other places, I believe we need to develop a science and this is a call to action to do that. I'd like to put this in an almost decade long context. I know that's out of fashion for computer architects to do history uh, first. And then what we'll do is we'll look at these mobile SOCs, which I think may be showing a way forward. I'll give you a model that is a way to think about them. And then we'll end with a call to action. And if you're waiting for answers in this talk, it's like waiting for Godot. It's not going to happen. All right, so information technology has changed our world. It required innovations up and down the hardware stack. Key things are the semiconductor technology and computer architecture. I like this chart from Stanford, which sort of gives computer architects half the credit. I'm sure technologists would disagree with that, but we have played a role. The technologists for a long time was giving us, were giving us more and faster transistors with uh, lower power, and we made things go even faster by using these transistors in parallel. Obviously, it's easy to use the transistors in parallel for memory and caches, which is my bread and butter, uh, because we have data hungry applications that we're moving memories from megabytes to gigabytes to terabytes. But what I'm going to talk about here today is using transistors in parallel for processing. And to do this, we haven't been able to use sort of a single tool, but we've had to develop uh, multiple various tools, bit, instruction, thread, and data level parallelism. And we're going to argue the accelerator level parallelism of SOCs is going to spread more broadly. All right, so here's the cartoon of a uni processor with a processor cache bus memory interfaces to devices. And the red lines sort of show the bandwidth use, where a fatter line is more bandwidth, so there's higher bandwidth to the caches and less going down. And these used uh, bit level parallels and BLP and instruction level parallelism from the beginning. So bit level parallelism uh, was the fact that you could you started out with devices that it might take a long time to do a multiply with a partial product every cycle. But if we have more transistors, we can do things like Wallace trees and get results very quickly at a cost of more transistors, which fortunately Moore's law was giving us larger words help, but you can't do this forever. And the important thing is this is relatively easy for software. I should note that there's a reversal of this trend of bit-level parallelism, at least in machine uh, learning inference accelerators, where we're going to smaller word sides or even analog. All right, bit-level parallelism, uh, I mean, instruction-level parallelism, as you all know, is the idea that we logically do instructions sequentially one at a time, but we actually do them highly overlapped and with a lot of speculation to the extent which Intel Skylake, you know, has a 20, 224 entry reorder buffer and a 14 to 19 stage pipeline. By the way, the picture up there shows IBM Stretch from 1961, which was the first computer I know about that used um, instruction level parallelism. 
And you can see that it stretches way back in the room, so it was decidedly not a microprocessor. Um, this, of course, was wildly successful uh, because it was very easy for software. You could come up with a new generation and the software just worked. Next type of parallelism, which you all know about, is thread level parallelism. I'm showing a picture of a multiprocessor here uh, where there's going to be communication in the interconnection network or a bus among the various uh, processors and memories. Um, this thread level parallelism was pioneered at least as far back as the CDC 6600, which was actually a multi threaded processor, we would call it today. Uh, and of course, the problem with this is that it's totally uh, visible to software. And that gave us great concern about using it because it was a niche success, but suddenly exploded everywhere. Now, some would have you believe that the switch to multi core was like this great planned innovation. Uh, in fact, it was a forced choice. This is a picture of the Intel Pentium Pro Extreme Edition, which looks suspiciously like two Pentium Pros that are both relatively square bolted on next to each other. And in fact, that's exactly what it was. The two processors couldn't even communicate without going off chip. Uh, we were very concerned uh, 15 years ago that this was going to really put a big wrench in things. But it turns out that there is a lot of thread level parallelism. It's just not uniformly distributed. There's much more in the cloud example than the depth. And in my opinion, big bifurcation happened where a few experts program for thread level parallelism and everybody uses it even if they don't know how to uh, program it. Uh, so what happened then was things moved on chip. So this rectangle represents the fact that uh, that part of the system is on chip, not the memory. Okay, another really old kind of parallelism goes by many names. I'll call it data level parallelism. And its names have been included, single instruction multiple data or SIMD, vectors, streaming SIMD extensions or SSE. It goes back at least as far as the ILIAC-4 in 1966. Many niche successes, not widely used until general purpose graphics processing units. And why is that? It's hard to separate factors, but one thing is the single instruction multiple thread or SIMD programming model seems easier for experts to use than the previous models. Um, the math libraries and the language support is, is excellent, in part because there was wide distribution. And finally, uh, things only cost a few thousand dollars, not a few million dollars, so many people could experiment and innovate. And once again, there's a tremendous bifurcation. Only experts program these GP GPUs, but everybody uses it. So. You know, when you, when you go and you uh, ask the internet and your favorite uh, smartphone, I want to see a cat video, uh, you're probably invoking uh, language models and other image learning that's been trained with uh, data level parallelism. Okay, and as follows the usual trends, GPUs were and are discrete, but now there's awful a lot of integrated GPUs that get into the black rectangle representing a chip. Okay, so here is my quickie view of the better part of a century of computer architecture. Um, so on the X axis is decade from 1940 to the present. On the Y axis is various forms of parallelism and uh, black represents niche success and green represents broad success. So we see that instruction and bit level parallelism got broad success early, uh, principally because they're easy for software. Thread and data level parallelism had niche success for a long time until the end of Denard scaling shown by the uh, red rectangle uh, kind of forced things. And then we got multi-core and we got uh, GP GPUs with SIMT. And our hypothesis in this talk is there's another level of parallelism coming right now called accelerator level parallelism. And right now it only has um, niche success in mobile SOCs, but there's reasons why it might become more common as we will argue. Okay, so if uh, indeed these mobile SOCs are showing the way, uh, let's learn a little bit about them. 
Okay, so you can crudely think of a mobile SOC as taking everything we knew about CPUs and GPUs and put it in the star field of a American flag and then fill up the stripe part of the American flag with all kinds of buses and accelerators of various types. And I appreciate you can't see them in the picture, but it's just a cartoon. Okay, and why are we gonna do that? Well, first of all, these accelerators, as I think most of you already know, it's a hardware component that executes a targeted computation class faster and usually with much less energy. So it's actually poorly named because often with the overhead, it, it may not be much faster, but it definitely does less energy. And so here's some really old data that you can't believe too much that shows various uh, chips from 2002 and shows energy power efficiency where each of those horizontal lines represents a decimal order of magnitude and going from general purpose like PowerPC to a digital signal processor to very dedicated gets you many orders of magnitude in the best case. So that is the, that is the, the carrot that's causing us to do this. And this has gotten pretty serious. So this is the Apple uh, A12 chip and those green boxes represent the CPUs. Okay, there's two big cores on the left and four little cores on the right and they represent a small fraction of the chip. All the rest of this is various accelerators um, and caches. Also has 42 accelerators. It's like, four, man, the engineer in me says, 42, really? Is that optimal? I know it's an answer in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but my intuition suggests that it's not optimal. Okay, so to understand, to do computer, good computer architecture, you have to understand your workload. So at least on these mobile SOCs, it's all about use cases where you're doing one or a few things at once. So this is an example use case of recording high definition video, beginning with the camera sensor uh, to the left and, uh, and eventually processing things. So what happens here? So first of all, these rectangular boxes now circled with uh, red represent uh, the various accelerators and CPUs. The CPU is cho choreographing this, not shown. Uh, they generally operate in parallel. In, in this example, in a pipeline fashion, but in other examples like the video conferencing we're doing right now, it's uh, much more interactive. So lots of computational parallelism among the IP blocks, okay? Secondly, uh, there's a lot of cases where there's a lot of data. And in this case, this data goes on and off chip uh, six times, six round trips in the course of this use case. And so you definitely have to pay attention to the off-chip bandwidth. This is not operating on a couple little scalars here. Uh, and so what we're gonna call this operating of all these IP blocks more in parallel than sequentially, that's the uh, accelerator level parallelism. Parallelism among components and currently executing on multiple accelerators or IPs. Okay, so here's uh, what a mobile SOC might do, each of these horizontal lines represents a different use case. And any given time you're concentrating on one use case, like the video capture we just showed, and the X's with the different IP blocks show which ones are active. So even if you had um, you know, 42 IP blocks, it's pretty unlikely they're all active for a given use case, but presumably there are some use case they're important for, otherwise they shouldn't have been put on there. Uh, use cases operate more concurrently than serially. And, you know, there's questions like, well, for a given use case, you know, how much acceleration do you really need, right? For example, for recording 4K video, you don't have to record faster than the video is coming at you. After that, you're wasting power. So what do we think of this ALP? Well, it's the number of active IPs in the use case over time, okay? And so uh, it might look like this. Now, the disclaimer here is that this is totally made up data, and I would encourage you to get data. In fact, G Vijay Janapan Reddy, my co-author, has work on, you know, his student is trying to develop an infrastructure to do this, and it's hard, but I think it's necessary. And I think this is another level to look at. Now, we should remember, by the way, within each of these IPs, there is a whole bunch of parallelism, right? So if one of the IPs is a, um, is a GPU, it's going to have that SIMT parallelism. So, uh, this is uh, hierarchical or uh, recursive parallelism. Okay, so why don't I stop there for a second to see if Mark wants to read any super urgent questions 
Uh, if not, uh, we can None just yet. push on. None yet. Yes. Okay. So I would argue that these things are complicated because they're heterogeneous. And when things are complicated, I like to get my head around things. Um, when I was at Google, my manager said, why don't you come up with better ways to design these SOCs? And my first reaction was gasp. You know, that's, that's a ridiculous charge for uh, an intern, even an old one. And so I said, well, how can we get a handle on this? Okay, and I'm, I'll tell you about our answer, which is a model, but I also want to preface that by saying, even if you totally dislike this model, it's, it's okay. We still need to deal with this accelerator level parallelism. Okay, so one of the problems you have with these SOCs is you might be a, an end designer and you choose, or a user of an SOC chip, and you have to choose the SOC that you want to use. Well, this data is a little bit old, but there's lots of SOCs to choose from. How are you going to choose? It's not like you're going to port some part of your use case to somebody's specific dig to signal processor and say, nah, that doesn't work. Uh, in fact, I was shocked to learn in 2019 that Facebook doesn't even bother to use any of these accelerators because it just can't handle the diversity and it wants its application to run robustly uh, everywhere. So something's wrong with this picture. So how do you reason about performance, you know, short of porting and developing simulation infrastructure? And that's even more important if you're designing one of these SOCs, because you got many, many degrees of freedom that are heterogeneous. You got to select the IPs, you got to size them, you got to design the uncore, the interconnection networks, et cetera. Okay. And you know, how do you even start? Because you want to provide some evidence that something has the potential to be useful before you investigate it further. Okay? So in computer architecture, there's a long history of performance models that provide some insight. So Amdahl's law is uh, perhaps the most famous and the most useful. Uh, Roofline is a very good model for homogeneous multi-core chips where every processor core is the same. And we're going to review it because we're going to build upon it. Uh, and in general, in the uh, design space of accuracy, effort, and insight, models versus simulation and other techniques can give you a lot of insight for a little effort, but they're definitely less accurate. And so I like to think of them as they give a first answer, not a final answer. They give you some information about whether you should proceed and investigate further. Okay, and so we're gonna present one such model called Gables that extends roof line to give a first answer for SOCs with many, uh, many accelerators. And it works for these mobile SOCs, and I would argue that it'll probably work for other SOCs, but that is to be demonstrated. Okay, so first, we're gonna build on roof line. So roof line takes all the blood, sweat, toil, and tears of hardware designers de designing a homogeneous multiprocessor with identical CPUs, and boils it down to two numbers, okay? There's the peak performance of all the cores running flat out, no synchronization, no bottlenecks. And there's the peak bandwidth off chip, not even making a distinction between whether you're bringing things on or off chip or whether the DRAM page is open or closed. So all hardware boiled down to two parameters. If you think that's bad, we're gonna boil software down to one parameter. We're gonna say for a given kernel or a part of the computation, What's really relevant is this parameter I or operational intensity. And this is the number of operations you do versus the number of bytes you bring off chip. So say you're bringing in two double precision floating point vectors and doing some kind of a uh, sum multiply add, which has two operations. You're gonna bring in 16 bytes through two operations, you'll have an operational intensity of eight. Everything else is in the noise. That's the one parameter for software. And then from that, we're going to visually show an upper bound on the performance attainable. You may not get it, but you shouldn't be able to get more than it. Okay, and this is called roof line because the plot looks like a roof line. Okay, so on the y axis is performance attainable, which is on a log scale. Uh, another key parameter is peak performance, which manifests itself as a horizontal line. You can't do better than running all the processor cores flat out. Okay, and then on the x-axis, we have this log of operational intensity. So if your operational intensity is very high, you have great use in your caches, registers, or vector registers, 
then um, you're going to be limited by your peak performance. If on the other hand, your uh, operation potentially is pretty low, or you're close to streaming, you're going to be limited by your off-chip bandwidth. Which man this man manifests itself as a horizontal line here with the peak off-chip bandwidth times the operational intensity. And the overall performance then is the minimum of these two lines, which looks like a roof line, hence the name roof line. A nice model, uh, you, you might think it's too simple to be useful. I have found it very useful for what it does. It's not, it's a first answer, not a final answer. Okay, so it would be nice to sort of, you know, do a roof line for these 42 accelerators. Well, I couldn't figure out how to do a simple roof line, but it does kind of look, if you squint your eyes, that you might be able to do a roof line for each IP block, the accelerators and the CPUs. And so maybe we could do a model where we have a whole bunch of roof lines and then we somehow mash them together to get a prediction for the whole chip. And that's exactly what Gables does. It uses a roof line per IP as the first answer and it then models the performance as a gabled roof, which I'll show you in a second. And it gives you some little sense of whether to, how to select and size the accelerators. And so here is a multi gabled roof. Uh, and so hence the name Gables here. So we're gonna have that for our SOC. And some people might say, hey, this model is way more complicated than roof line. Guilty, it is more complicated, but it's more complicated, I think, largely in part because these SOCs are way more complicated than a homogeneous multi-core chip. Okay, so here's the model. So let's say the CPUs complex are uh, IP zero, intellectual property X zero. It's gonna have a certain bandwidth B0 in and out of the CPU complex, have peak performance, which was that old woof line parameter multiplied by A0, in, case, in this case, A0 is one. That's what we're gonna to normalize to. And the other accelerators will have their own bandwidths and will have other accelerations, hopefully greater than one. Um, and that's it for the accelerators. Okay, and then somehow we're gonna do some simple math and you can see the paper for this uh, to share the off-peak bandwidth, okay? On the software side, we're going to have this operational intensity parameter, but it's going to have, there's going to be an operational intensity parameter for each different accelerator block. And the reason for that, or each IP block, and the reason for that is you might give a different part of the work to different IP blocks because they're good at different things. And secondly, that IP block may have different capabilities of enabling reuse of memory. Uh, the reuse of memory is locally is what allows your operational intensity to be high. Notice when you reuse something, we're not even making fine distinctions like whether it's a cache or whether it's a scratch pad. Okay, so that's a series of, of operational intensities. And then what we're gonna do is, uh, for a given use case, you're gonna assign certain work to every accelerator. Some of the accelerators will get zero work because they're not used. Others will get some non-negative work such that they sum to zero. So this is very much like the F parameter in Amdahl's law or in Revisor and others, uh, multi-Amdahl, except that we're assuming that the work is done in parallel, not sequentially. That's a, that's a big difference. The other difference with Amdahl's law and multi-Amdahl is that we're paying attention to bandwidth uh, as Roofline does. Okay, so uh, I find people learn better with a simple example than the equations, even though the equations are elegant. Uh, so let's do a two IP SOC. It just has CPUs and a GPU. And of course, this is so simple, you don't really need, you don't think you need games, but I'll show you it's, it's not as simple as you might think. Okay, so let's assume that the peak performance of the CPUs is uh, 40 giga operations per second. The CPUs can take in a bandwidth of six gigabytes per second and the off chip uh, bandwidth is 10 gigabytes per second. And the GPU, um, has greater bandwidth uh, because it's, uh, it's designed for streaming. It has an acceleration factor of five, so it has great potential. Of course, this is a stupid design right now because you wouldn't want to have the B1 be greater than the off-chip bandwidth. Okay, and then we're gonna assume on the software side, when we first have this workload, we're doing all the work at the CPU because we haven't employed the GPU yet. So F0 is one and F1 is zero. We're gonna assume the CPU is pretty good at caching for this pretend workload that we get an operational intensity of eight. When we finally give work to the GPU, um, it's gonna have a very low operational intensity because it's basically streaming. 
So what's our performance going to be? Well, first of all, what, is our, what does a Gables plot looks like? Well, it looks a lot like a roof line plot, except there are multiple lines, OK? So on the y-axis, once again, we have the performance attainable. Um, and then on the x-axis, we have this operational intensity, both on a log scale. We now have two lines. Um, the purple line is the line for the CPU, and it looks like a conventional roof line, whereas the uh, orange line is just a line, and it represents the bound from the off-chip bandwidth, which we report separately here. OK, and so the way you interpret these is you look at the average operational intensity. And since all work was done at the CPU, that's eight. You go up to the lowest line that you encounter, and you go over and read off the performance, and the performance is 40. I know what you're saying. That's not very impressive, Mark, because that's the performance you assume that the CPUs can do. So indeed, in this case, we are, we are CPU bound by the CPUs. OK. but let's now assign some work to the GPU. Okay, so you know, GPU is five times faster, so why don't we give it uh, you know, three quarters of the work? That sounds like a good start. We're going at 40. We should be able to go much faster toward that 200, I would expect. Well, actually not, okay? Our performance actually tanks to, I think it's 1.3 here, rounded to one giga ops per second. So we went from 40 to one. Why is that? It's because we assigned most of the work to the, the GPU and the GPU had very little reuse. So it's bandwidth use totally dominates things. And the average operational intensity is around 0.1. And so we're way down here and we're totally limited by the orange curve, which was the memory bandwidth curve. And notice we now have three uh, roof lines because we've added the GPU because uh, we're using it. Uh, and the GPU is the, uh, the yellow line. All right, so we look at this and say, oh, we're bandwidth limited. We're the engineer, we're not the uh, economist. And so what we're gonna do is, uh, um, we're going to break this uh, bottleneck, right? So we're gonna say, well, I didn't like this off-chip bandwidth of 10, I'm gonna make it 30, okay? Now, of course, you know, a real engineer would say, well, wait a second, that's way expensive. You sure you wanna do that? Well. Okay, I'm only on a PowerPoint slide, so I can do it really easily. What happens if we do that? We're going, we were at 40, we went down to 1.3. What are we going to go to now? Well, it turns out we're going to go to two, okay? This really doesn't help. Uh, we, we use the bandwidth, we increase the bandwidth a lot. In fact, the bandwidth is now that orange line. It's not the limiting factor. It's a log scale. It's actually a little ways off. But we didn't go very far because we are totally limited by the bandwidth into the, into the GPU. So something else has to happen. Uh, to make this work better, uh, what we can do is we can say, well, let's make the GPU now have operational intensity of 8 instead of 0.1. Okay, this is easy to say. This is hard to do. Right? In order to do this, you have to make sure that the GPU has sufficient RAM of some port that you can get reuse. And secondly, you have to change your algorithm and it has to be possible to really use that RAM effectively. But if you can do that and you can make its operational intensity eight, maybe some good things will happen. And I also happen to know we can get away with reducing the peak op chip bandwidth from 30 to 20. And if we do all of this, we now have an average operational intensity of eight. We go up here. We get up to uh, 160 with a perfectly balanced triple bottleneck design, and we get a, a performance of 160 giga ops per second. Okay, it's left for an exercise for the students and professors to uh, do better, and you, you can do better. Uh, in general, roof line, if you're using K accelerators, uh, the Gables model will display K plus one roof lines, uh, one for each IP block and one for the um, the off-chip memory bandwidth. Okay, this has actually been used within uh, six months of publication. Synopsys actually included uh, a version of Roofline into their uh, tool flow, uh, you know, as a double check, right? This is not a final answer. But let me give you two examples already where it helped. Okay, so there were two examples where, um, and I, this was not my work, I just heard about it where Gables predicted a much higher number than their simulation tools. 
okay? In the first case, what happened was that the root cause was there were too, too few buffers to cover the communication latency on one particular communication. So you weren't getting the bandwidth that Gable thought you could uh, in the actual design. And when they changed the design to add buffers, they got performance much closer to Gable. So this was an excellent example. The second example uh, where uh, Gable's predicted a number much higher than the simulation, the root cause ended up being that the, the use case, the task graph was not completely parallel like Gable's assumes. So in this case, you know, there was no simple fix but it shed light on the fact that there wasn't enough parallelism and maybe there was a change there you could get to it or else you had to accept that there was a difference but i still think the double check is uh, useful i'm going to not skip this allocating sram this can help with allocating sram um, and finish and then pause after this slide there's a bunch of extensions in the in the paper in hp uh, hpca 2019 including extensions to allow some non-parallel work. There's an interactive tool that you can play with and where you can just do rough line plots, kind of like what I did on those slides. And you can even get an Android app from GitHub. Okay, so in summary, uh, you know, Gables models these chips as a, um, with multiple roof lines uh, and, uh, it can help you get a first answer. And let's just remember, this is like Amdahl's law. So it's just a first answer, uh, but it doesn't say anything, just like Amdahl's law doesn't say anything about exactly how you program it, whether it's shared memory or message passing or there's cues or whatever, but it's a start. Okay, and let me stop there and see if uh, Mark has any urgent questions queued up before we finish. Um, nope, not yet. I think people okay. keep the questions to the end as asked. All right. You, uh, you lied to me. You told me Israelis were, uh, didn't follow rules, but uh, okay. All right. So that's a model. I think it's useful. You may disagree. You can disagree. Regardless of whether that model is a good idea, I think there should be a call to action for accelerator par level parallelism. Okay. And this is what I forecast before. There's a lot of stuff we want to do. I want a holodeck. Okay, if I can't have a holodeck, there's still some virtual reality things. You know, we could do these virtual meetings a little bit better. I, Zoom is not the ultimate. Uh, augmented reality has lots of potentials, both for work and, and other situations. Uh, we can definitely accelerate how fast people can learn by tailoring things to, you know, as professors know, you always try to give people the, you know, the the example that they can handle that stretches them the furthest. And, you know, that can be done, I think. Uh, and there's a great potential for various self-driving vehicles. Um, typical Gardner hype cycle with self-driving cars predicted uh, immediate change. And of course that expectation crashed, but in the long run, I think this is very profound. And a lot of this is being done by, um, uh, yeah, enabled by deep neural networks, and I expect other aspects of AI will also become important. And all of these things, if we can do them with tremendously more energy efficiently, can be applied to many more places. So this is a great time. Okay, so that's the justification that the apps need more computing. We're not getting the scaling. I think this multiple accelerator approach is promising. Okay, but you know, for Apple or, or Android developers, they spend untold engineer hours trying to bailing wire together a few use cases. And it doesn't matter if the programming environment is terrible uh, because it's, their market is so big. But as I've seen with many other things is that, you know, there may be other markets that, you know, you can only sell 100 million or 10 million or 1 million. And, you know, you, tools that can make these things easier to program would be a great thing. So let's think a little bit about how, you know, a software view of these chips, right? So uh, if you go back in the days when we just had a single processor, I'm blowing off memory and IO, even though I love memory, uh, you know, a single processor is relatively easy to uh, program. When we got a homogeneous multi-core, you know, that's hard, but a lot of applications had enough data level parallelism so you could split it among the um, processors and you, you descend into hell just a little bit. Okay. 
Now let's do a thought experiment. Let's say I got a homogeneous multicore, but I'm going to require you to not use data parallelism. You have to, you have to assign different parts of the computation, like a pipeline in that recording video example, to different processors, or it might be more complicated into a processor. That's harder, even if in this case we pretend that the software, the hardware is the same. So why are we doing this thought experiment? Because actually what happens is that uh, you have to divide up your problem heterogeneously like in the previous thought experiment, but now for these things, you also have to deal with the fact that there's actually gonna be different hardware accelerators for these different parts. And these different hardware accelerators may have different high level languages, including domain specific language. Today, they often have different software development kits. And so theoretically that doesn't matter, but practically, it does. And then, you know, for people like Mark to think about, it's even worse, all this stuff is hidden behind kernel drivers, which makes, uh, um, you know, development a big pain and often communication between the accelerators has to go through many layers of software. It's hard to believe that uh, the uh, picture on the right is uh, where we want to end up ultimately. Uh, and I should notice one of the thing, one property of this is that each of the accelerators has some notion of abstraction uh, for itself, some good, some bad. But there really is no general uh, abstraction of the whole chip. You're sort of on your own to reason about it. So let's think about GP GPUs, okay? And you know these came after four decades of SIMD vectors and SSEs, and in the beginning for programming concurrency and communication, you had some stuff, right? You had OpenGL library, you had, you could only run the CPU or the GPU. There were a few mechanisms for concurrency. I um, mean, we could do par uh, embarrassingly parallel easy, but there's few mechanisms for limiting. Copying was done very explicitly and you couldn't do many changes to the hardware because general purpose was a zero billion dollar market, okay? Now that has evolved tremendously in part driven by uh, the fortuitous uh, deep neural networks. SIMT model has been very successful. There's much more fine grain management of concurrency. You have shared memory sometimes and sometimes coherence, which may or may not be a good thing. Uh, and general purpose has now become a major player. So can we do a similar thing for uh, accelerator level parallelism? Because right now what we have is, you know, programming, we got per IP special domain specific languages and software development kits and global is totally ad hoc. Concurrency management, totally ad hoc. Communication, up and down the hardware stack. You know, even if you propose some fancy hardware queue between two accelerators, how exactly do the two drivers invoke that? It's, it's not trivial. And designing is very difficult. So we would like to do better. We'd like to be, you know, like inspired by SIMT and have a model for the whole chip. Uh, we'd like to have perhaps assistance in scheduling. CPUs, for example, there's no hardware assistance for scheduling beyond an interrupt, uh, whereas GPUs do scheduling with a symbiosis between software and low level, what looks like hardware in the GPU. Should communication be done with caches, Q pairs? Should we separate control and data planes? You know, I don't have the answers, but I think we want to make a science out of this if we're going to make it more generally applicable. Okay, so I'll finish here with a final cartoon uh, for programmability. Um, you know, what should our runtime model be? Can we do some kind of DAG of streams or stream data flow? Um, for concurrency, how do we virtualize these uh, um, accelerator blocks, these IP blocks? How do we partition them if they're used more than once? Uh, for communication, as I said, what does the hardware do? And more importantly, what does the software do? And then finally, the design space is really large. When do we combine similar accelerators? If you combine a similar accelerator, it can save a lot of area, but then the accelerator may be less optimal at doing any given thing, costing you power. How is that trade-off made? So Hennessy and Patterson said that uh, a couple years ago in their Turing Award lecture, that it's a new golden age for computer architecture. I would argue that this is a new golden age for computer science. And so with that, I'll show you one slide of advertisement and then I'll take questions.
So the advertisement is if you're interested in memory consistency and cache coherence, I encourage you to look at our new synthesis lecture, which I hope is uh, free to students and faculty at the Technion. Uh, the big change is there's a chapter on GPU coherence and a chapter pointing to some of the great formal methods works that happened since the first edition in 2011. So end of it, it shameless plug. All right, with that, Mark, I'll take questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you know, taking a round of applause here, um, uh, distributed virtual applause, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks, and uh, um, so let me just um, uh, probably stop the recording and open the, uh, open the uh, 